The Terran Space Academy presents Space News, brought to you by Amazon Lunar Oxygen Service. When you absolutely positively want to keep breathing, go Amazon Oxygen Service. Only two Elons and one Bezos per month. Some restrictions apply. May be discontinued at any time without warning. Failure to maintain payments will result in Space Ninjas removing your tanks in the middle of your sleep cycle. Welcome to this Terran News Service update. We bring you the latest advances in science and technology that are relevant to the space industry. Today we will be bringing you up to date on two areas of critical interest. Now as the trade school to the stars, the Terran Space Academy tries to keep you as up to date on proven space technology as possible. But we must all, however, keep an eye on innovations in areas that will revolutionize the space industry. We are all using chemical rockets in our plans to explore and colonize space because no one has yet been able to make a working fusion reactor. That looks like it is about to change. Now first up, let's cover the enabling technology. Scientists all over the world are working on achieving the holy grail of physics, a room temperature superconductor. Room temperature superconductors, those that can operate at about 22 Celsius or 72 Fahrenheit, would cause a paradigm shift in human technology. We would be looking at zero energy loss when transmitting electricity, superconducting magnets allowing us to get the same job done with one-fifth the power, computer processors running faster than anything available today without the need for cooling systems. The discovery of superconductivity at 203 Kelvin in sulfonium. Sulfonium is a sulfur hydride and a conjugate acid of hydrogen sulfide gas is a game changer. The phenomenon of superconductivity, what I often wrongly call superconduction, is described by the Bardeen Cooper Schreifer and the Migdal Elishberg theories. Those of you with more physics expertise than I have can study these theories and understand why superconductors work and use these theories to predict which materials might be good candidates to test to make better superconductors. The rest of us will read your summaries. These theories predict the possibility of room temperature superconductivity in metals that have lattice vibrations at high frequencies. Now remember that one bar is about one atmosphere at Earth sea level, which is also about 14.7 pounds per square inch or 101,325 pascals of pressure. Also remember that while Celsius starts at zero, being the freezing point of water, Kelvin uses the same scale but starts at absolute zero which would be minus 273.15 Celsius. Normally we want to do everything in Kelvin, but as we get close to room temperature, converting to something more familiar can help us understand. So subtract 273 from any Kelvin reading to get a good Celsius approximation. The previous record of 203 Kelvin with sulfonium translates to about minus 70 Celsius, still cold, but definitely within the capability of liquid nitrogen, which boils at minus 196 Celsius. Now the sulfonium was under millions of bars of pressure to superconduct at 203 Kelvin. The use of these theories allowed first principles calculations based on density functional theory to suggest a new family of superconducting hydrides that possess a clathrate like structure in which the host atom, usually calcium or yttrium, is at the center of a cage formed by other atoms such as hydrogen. Now these crystals can be placed under extreme pressure to enhance the effects of cooling them and reduce atomic motion, thereby increasing the chance of superconductivity. Computer simulations suggested that the element lanthanum might be a good candidate for those superconducting crystals. These simulations suggested that lanthanum hydrogen crystals should superconduct with a critical temperature between 240 and 320 Kelvin at megabar pressures. The scientists created crystals of one lanthanum atom for 10 hydrogen atoms and their studies have reported superconductivity with a critical temperature of around 250 Kelvin at a pressure of about 170 gigapascals. This is the highest critical temperature that has been confirmed so far in a superconducting material. Superconductivity was proven with the observation of zero resistance and a decreasing critical temperature under an external magnetic field. This means that exposing a superconductor to a magnetic field strong enough will cause the superconductor to only superconduct at an even lower temperature. So it will lower the critical temperature to expose a superconductor to a strong magnetic field. So here we go from sulfonium having superconductivity at minus 70 Celsius to lanthanum decahydride which superconducts at 20 Celsius. 
Now the antifreeze in our cars, if it's a 50-50 mixture, freezes at about minus 34 Celsius. Dry ice, which is just frozen carbon dioxide, is at minus 78 Celsius. Now these compounds are great for the lab, but we will still need to use other materials in the real world because of the extreme pressures that these materials superconduct at. Niobium titanium and niobium tin can superconduct at liquid helium temperatures. Niobium germanium can superconduct at liquid hydrogen temperatures. These are better for our current spaceships and colonies because they work under normal pressure that they do need these liquids to cool them. Now why are higher temperature superconductors so important? That brings us to our second update today, which is on fusion energy. So remember that liquid helium is needed for all current commercially available superconductors that can withstand the stress produced by the electromagnetic fields generated by the superconducting coils needed to generate a powerful magnetic field. The invention of a superconducting ribbon using a high temperature rare earth barium copper oxide strip layered between silver and copper has allowed a new much smaller design for a fusion reactor. The stronger the magnetic field, the better the confinement density and insulation from the device can be. With more powerful fields, you can make a smaller reactor. In fact, doubling the strength of your magnetic field allows you to cut the size in half and reduce the volume by a factor of eight. Compare the ITER fusion reactor using old superconductor designs with the spark reactor using the new technology. Also remember that powerful magnetic fields can interfere with electron travel in some superconductors while other materials can superconduct even in extremely powerful magnetic fields. REBCO is a generic term for the superconducting crystals discovered in the 1980s. Rare earth barium copper oxide. Rare earths include yttrium, lanthanum, and gadolinium. The spark reactor uses yttrium while the device for a magnetic sail being created by Dr. Craig Davidson's lab at the University of New Mexico uses gadolinium. These rare earth barium copper oxide superconductors are crystals and hard to form into wires. Scientists at MIT were able to deposit a layer of them on thin steel ribbons. These ribbons can then be layered with ribbons of other materials to produce a strong flexible ribbon that can be wound into a coil that we call a solenoid, remember. Solenoids produce very concentrated magnetic fields. These ribbons are used to make the D-shaped superconducting magnets you see here. Remember that while superconductors have no resistance to electron travel, they have a limit to how much electricity they can conduct. This is called a critical current. The higher the critical current, the stronger the magnetic field that can be generated by a superconductor. Now if the critical temperature is high enough that the superconductor can be cooled by liquid nitrogen instead of liquid helium, the expense of running your device drops by an order of magnitude. The power and money you put into your device must be exceeded by the value of the energy surplus it produces or it cannot fund itself. The efficiency of a fusion reactor is represented by the variable Q. Q takes into account the temperature, density, and confinement time of a fusion plasma. If Q is greater than 1, your device is producing more fusion energy than you are putting in and might be commercially viable. Less than Q is a research device that will need fine tuning and funding. If we can ever get fusion reactors producing enough energy to pay for themselves, we will have a rapid increase in innovation. In 1994, the best test reactors had a Q of 0.3. By 1997, it had more than doubled to 0.7. The goal of Spark is to reach a Q of 2 and be commercially viable. To simplify the operation of the device, it will be pulsed every 10 seconds. Its magnets will produce 12 Tesla field. The Earth's magnetic field at the equator is about 0.00003035 Tesla. So the magnets at Spark will create a field of magnetic force almost 400,000 times stronger than the Earth. Spark should produce 50 times more power per 10 second pulse than any other reactor to date. This is one way that advanced superconductors will change the world. If we had efficient, inexpensive room temperature superconductors, we could have fusion powered spacecraft and handheld medical scanners with amazing capabilities. Look at this size comparison between the Spark reactor and the current Starship design and imagine what a second stage powered by a 100 megawatt fusion reactor would be capable of.
Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe and stay safe. We will keep you up to date on progress in fields important to your future in the space industry.